Great. Um, okay, I'm gonna let folks in. Admit all. Okay. Hey everyone, thanks for your patience as we uh, worked out an audio issue. Um, welcome to City Forum. It's our first City Forum of the spring semester. We were hoping to meet in person, but for obvious reasons, we we're uh, unable to do that. We're glad that um, Dr. Thomas was able to pivot to uh, an online format uh, for this talk. Uh, we're really excited that she's um, she was able to join us today. Um, so I've got a quick intro and then I'm just gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Thomas. I guess I should say also for folks that are not familiar, City Forum is a roughly bi-weekly uh, talk series that we have sponsored by the graduate program in community regional planning at the University of Texas. Um, and we invite speakers um, either who have like a kind of national perspective on uh, issues relevant to urban planning or often we'll have kind of local Austin uh, regional speakers as well across all the kind of sub disciplines of planning, whether it's environmental housing or transportation. Um, so today for our uh, first lecture of the spring series, we have Dr. Destiny Thomas. Um, Dr. Thomas is a leading and critical voice pushing for long needed changes within urban planning and the design disciplines more broadly. She's the founder and CEO of Thrivance Group, a multi-regional socially responsible for-profit firm that works to make public spaces and public services more safe, healthy, and accessible, especially for Black, Indigenous, and transgender people and people with disabilities. Um, she's an anthropologist planner from Oakland, California, and has a combined 15 years of experience in nonprofit management management and project management within government agencies, including the California Department of Transportation and the City of Los Angeles. In addition, Dr. Thomas has led advancements in statewide racial equity initiatives for over a decade. Our focus has been urban planning, policy writing, and organizational development in communities most impacted by racial inequities. Um, to me, um, knowing Dr. Thomas's work for, for some time, um, her research and practice have shown us what justice and planning really means. Um, while public and private sector actors often use ambiguity over equity definitions or measures as a smokescreen to stall real progress, Dr. Thomas has shown us that if we're focused on justice, then dignity must be central to our work. Critically, she teaches us that dignity requires relief from suffering and that in our work as planners, we must focus on those who have long been denied access to decision-making power and access to the benefits of public investments. In transportation planning, this realization pushes us away from run-of-the-mill public engagement and cookie cutter equity and environmental justice analyses towards measures that aim to atone for and begin to repair a history of violence, displacement, and environmental and public health impacts wrought on communities across the country. Dr. Thomas is providing us with a new vocabulary and real world tools that we can use to build the future that planners have been talking about for decades. Um, Dr. Thomas earned a, a BA in political science from Fisk University in 2006, Master of Public Administration from Tennessee State University in 08, and a PhD in Social and Cultural Anthropology from the California Institute of Intercultural Studies in 2016. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Destiny Thomas uh, to our talk today. Thanks, Destiny. Thank you, Dr. Connor. You know, the anthropologist in me really loved that intro, all the words you chose. So I might ask you to send me a copy of that so I can update my bio. Thank you. I'm humbled to be in your presence and to be a colleague of yours. And I'm grateful for the space that's been created for us to have this very important conversation today. Um, folks who know me know I'm, I'm a charismatic person. So uh, please, please, please use whatever chat function you have access to, even if it's Twitter, um, to follow along, to give feedback, to make comments, um, because it's important to me that this work is not just work that we, you know, research that we conduct and present. I, I want this to be an ongoing dialogue in the field. Uh, I am also sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I'm a California girl and I don't do cold, ice, snow, none of that. Um, I, I am, however, just getting out of my own um, travel nightmare while trying to get from DC to what I thought would be Austin. So I'm even more grateful that I've made it to a couch that I could sit on and share with you today. I'm gonna share my slides. There are also a couple of videos I was hoping to show today that I'm not sure if my technology will allow me to do that. So um, I'm gonna apologize in advance if that doesn't work out for us. Um, 
Alex, can I get a verbal cue? Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes. I wanted to just check in for a second and ask Tony if we should be recording. Are we recording, Tony? Uh, we're recording to YouTube, which... Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep, we're, we're all... All right. Um, and then also, I can see the, like, the waiting room notifications. I don't know if you all can see that um, while I'm doing screen share, but just wanted to give someone a heads up that that's coming yeah. up. Yeah, perfect. All right, great. So this is transportation and the imperative of reparations. My favorite thing to talk about, I could talk about it all day, but today we've got 90 minutes. So let me get to it. Um, really this work, this idea of atoning for the legacy of harm in transportation planning and transportation uh, policy making is something that hits really close to home for me. My own origin story is wrapped up in you know, what it was like to be a young person living in the city of Oakland when Oscar Grant was killed on the BART platform. Uh, my best friend ever was killed in a car crash um, on a freeway, uh, you know, while she was driving home from work one night, you know, cold and by herself. Um, my first love, my, my first, you know, high school sweetheart, junior high sweet, sweetheart, um, he was killed while waiting for his bus that had an unusually long um, headway that night. He, he just was, you know, waiting at the bus stop in West Oakland and, and was and was murdered. Um, I've been in, you know, I've also experienced a number of um, traumas in the built environment. I rarely tell the story about um, working on my doctorate in San Francisco and driving across the the Bay Bridge every day to get to school from Oakland and having an officer follow me for what felt like e eternity, but maybe was like 10 minutes. Being pulled over, he didn't know, you know, he didn't have an answer for my question around why I was being pulled over. Um, at the time I presented um, in a way that was a little less gender conforming. And so I, I'm pretty sure he thought I was a black man when he pulled me over. Um, and I laid on the concrete for about two hours for no reason. Still to this day, I don't know why I was pulled over. So this, this issue for me is really important and it's a huge part of what I often refer to as the fire in my belly. So this is not just something I'm doing because I like studying or, you know, I, although I like riding my bike, I don't think I like it as much as I hear folks like it on Twitter. Um, transportation is about my freedom, my liberation and my safety. And so this work is, is again an honor um, to be a part of. And I can only hope that those ancestors who I've known personally and lost, um, those ancestors who I didn't know personally and lost, and certainly those who have come before me um, to do various forms of advocacy work on behalf of the struggle for liberation of Black people. I hope that they um, feel proud of the work that we're doing um, and continue to bless and, and approve of our journey. So when we talk about this legacy, most people know, hopefully most of the folks who are in this space know that um, mobility has always been contentious in the United States. The freedom of movement has always been in, in, in contest or contested, right? And one of the earliest known instances of that was slave patrols. And slave patrols were um, teams of people who, you know, were armed. Uh, they initially were just, you know, regular citizens who would hunt down, track, track down Black folks who um, either you know, were freedmen or former, former slaves or currently enslaved, they would capture them. And if you're lucky, you know, you could make it to some version of home alive, but most of the time they would be captured um, and, and turned back into captivity or, you know, hung if there was too much resistance there. And um, it's important that we never forget, right, that this, this, is a core component of transportation's um, origin story in the United States, right? When, when we look at 
the challenges that we're facing with policing in this country, we have to understand the basis by which policing came about. And this is one of them, right? We also know about Jim Crow laws, hopefully. <laughs> and um, the Jim Crow laws, even post um, state sanctioned slavery, um, really helped to facilitate the legacy of slavery and its intentions and the spirit of slavery would continue to live on um, even though the Civil War turned out the way that it did. Um, one of the Jim Crow laws that really created a, a great deal of difficulty and trauma for Black bodies traveling through space all over the country was this notion of sundown towns. Um, sundown towns were places where, okay, like you, you're not technically a slave anymore, but for the for the convenience of white comfort in certain communities, it it was illegal for black people to be visible in the built environment um, in certain communities past a certain curfew. They also had sidewalk etiquette laws. I remember my grandfather telling me stories about having to move off of the sidewalk altogether if you were passing by a white person in the built environment. Um, we know about segregation, right? I think Rosa Parks' birthday was yesterday. And this idea of separate but equal that came out of it, um, which still exists today in many forms. Um, and then we also, not as many people realize this, but we'll talk about, about this more in a second. We also know that transportation and the transportation industry played a, a very co-conspiratory role in redlining across the United States, right? So this happened by way of dis discriminatory insurance practices um, in the same way that folks would look at a map and, and call an area red and say that um, whoever lived in that area, you know, couldn't access um, funds for housing, either to um, maintain or obtain housing. Those same maps were used by um, automobile insurance companies to uh, basically imposed a black tax, right? Charged black folks or people who lived in red line communities um, more for their insurance or actually not give them insurance coverage at all. Um, this industry also co-conspired co and co-facilitated redlining by way of the implementation of the U US highway system. A lot of times when we talk about this, we hear about the freeways um, decimating predominantly black communities by way of eminent domain. This is very true, um, but the road and the roadways themselves also reinforce the literal lines and boundaries that um, folks were using on redlining maps to determine which communities were worthy of housing and other resources and which weren't. Um, also, you know, exploitive labor practices. There's a beautiful legacy of resistance there in uh, Los Angeles, California, where the Bus Riders Union um, really stood up against local government when even after all of this civil rights work and various uprisings had occurred, there was still this idea that um, black and brown, brown folks were expected to work for very low wages um, to live very far from these their jobs um, and to still pay like exuberant costs to get to and from work. Um, and so the dehumanization of bus riders is actually something that um, is, is longstanding practice that still exists today. Uh, so like the legacy, uh, it's one of the things I struggle with as an anthropologist is when we talk about something like re reparations uh, or or harm or trauma in the transportation sector, um, we frame it as a legacy that is a thing of the past, right? And so it's important that we understand that our current transportation planning and policy efforts are just as harmful as the government sanctioned atrocities of yesteryear, yesterday. And the photo that you see at the top of the screen is a real photograph of a real sign that existed. I don't know if it still exists but it existed um, in Los Angeles, California. I wanna say until the early 2000s, we used to have, folks who are from California know, maybe if they're my age or older, they know we used to have these signs on the roadway that would let people know that they um, were living in an area 
that um, immigrants were, were moving or traveling through. Um, and folks would, you know, use these signs in a very politicizing and polarizing way to, um, to dictate like how people would travel through certain spaces. I remember seeing this sign as a child and being, in, you know, even with my limited understanding of what a racialized experience is and the, the complexities of racism, um, this sign really stuck, stuck with me um, throughout my career. I had an experience when I was working at LADOT, and this is very recent, um, where a group of white supremacists who were also engineers um, created an inter iteration of this sign, um, put a lot of money and time into it actually, and, and mounted it um, on, a, on a pole outside of the building. It looked like a real wayfinding signage. And um, they had some verbiage under, underneath it about, you know, this is your, your tax dollars at work or whatever those construction signs usually say. And um, it, was, it was a scary moment in, in, for me. I remember um, tensing up when I saw it, being afraid to walk into the building because I wasn't sure if this was just, you know, a disgusting prank or if this was literally a sign of something bigger, right, going on. And the, the professional look and feel of it made it very clear to me that this had probably been done by someone who sits in the same building as me, right? And this was at a time where I was just beginning to, to challenge notion, notions of harm and racism in our industry and of course in my own workplace. Um, and, I, and I just felt terrified. And, um, you know, I, I remember asking someone to go and remove the sign and they did. And the sign never made it to the trash, y'all. The next day I came to work and whoever removed the sign, I was grateful that they had done it, um, but they left it in my cubicle. And so again, when we talk about the legacy of racism and like our current mandate in terms of atoning for that legacy, we can't ignore the fact that these things are, you know, still very much happening today. We have been doing, Thrivance Group has been doing some work in the city of Fresno to capture the oral histories of folks who have their own experiences with land use planning and decision making. And something that I wanna point out before we go into this video that I hope works um, is that part of this work is collecting oral histories. It's asking impacted communities how they've experienced these atrocities um, and of course what they need in order to, to um, be and feel as though they've been made whole. And um, the Thrivance method is not that we go around asking folks, tell us how much harm you've experienced, right? We're not asking people to bleed out so that we can believe that they've been affected. Um, we create cultural assets and gift them to the communities that we're working in. And we believe, you know, as practitioners of this work, that even, even through inspiring and endearing oral histories, we're able to identify where there are opportunities for atonement. So I thought I would share a portion of this with you all today so that you could see and hear for yourself that uh, this work doesn't always have to be about us Black folks proving that we've been harmed, right? There, there are signs of our trauma, even in how we celebrate ourselves. So I want to share this with you um, before I continue the presentation. And then Alex, just give me a, a verbal cue about the sound and video. Seems good. So home, as far as my senses go, I love Fresno, I'm country. So even though I'm from Compton and that's my claim to fame, I'm a country guy at heart. So I like the way Fresno feels, the smell, how it sounds when we get up in the morning how 
even in our community, if you don't know how to fish or hunt, as far as my family goes, it's like, you know, that's part of uh, your rite of passage, to be able to garden and those things that we don't learn how to do in Compton. I saw my grandmother, always, both grandmothers always had gardens. I mean, we learned how to skin rabbits, even hunt rabbits and pheasants, quail, fishing, you know. It was easy because we learned how to fish with chicken litter. We would catch crawfish and fish with the tails. Bonding moments. That's why I love Fresno because you have so many of them and it's, it's family oriented. Like, it's nothing like a Fresno family. They're always big and full of, full of people and you invite people into your family too. Your neighbors become part of your family because you do all of those things with them as well. So that's what Fresno feels and smells like to me. Well, I can say I come from a place that can smell like death. And I know that's kind of weird or funny to say, but um, growing up in West Fresno, waking up every morning, going to school, and knowing that it's a slaughterhouse right around the corner. Um, and even if you didn't know, you know you can smell it. Um, so I will say that. But what you'll see is, in that smell of all that death, you'll see full of life. You'll see a community full of life. Um, you'll see people stop in the middle road just to talk to their homie, talk to their next door neighbor, talk to their aunt. Um, you'll hear the kids playing, definitely for sure, screaming, running on just about any block you're on in West Fresno. And uh, you might hear some loud music, um, all types of music from different cultures, um, which is honestly sometimes very beautiful, hearing all the different music and smelling all the different smells of food that actually do come from each home. You can walk down one block and probably smell di three different cultures. Because when it comes to West Fresno, it is a lot. Um, it may not be a lot to see um, unless you want a, a very beautiful sunset. Um, the best sunset is in West Fresno. I don't think I've seen a better sunset anywhere else, especially if you're over there on Kearney Boulevard. Um, being in that area, being able to watch that sun just set um, and just drop and understanding that, I don't know, it's a, it's a community behind you that wants to see you do more. Um, I can say that for myself. I'm from a pretty peaceful neighborhood. Uh, the sounds during the day are what you would call basically no normal. You hear the birds chirping and you can hear the kids down at the, the end of the block playing in the school. And at even, in the evenings, you can hear the families and people coming out and uh, you can smell some of the foods that's being cooked in the neighborhood that make you, if you don't know what home is, it'll make you have a real realization of what uh, a home is. You can smell it and it smells like I need to pull my chair up to the table about right now and have some of that. Uh, uh, you look out and you see the kids playing. There's lots of kids in my neighborhood because there is a school down near the end of the block. The kids uh, are there laughing, playing. The sounds during the day are very relaxing. Uh, when you go out and you look into the sky, we have plants over here in the summer, and it's a lot better now, that bring the uh, fat, you know, chicken plant, and the smell comes down in the, in the spring and summer, which is very nauseating. It's a lot better in the last five years, but it's still bad. Uh, but the good thing about it is uh, we, as a community, can come outside and wave somebody you know and and uh, go down and talk to your neighbors. It's still that kind of community. And um, you can take a walk, taking a nice, long, leisurely walk. It's always there, you can always do it. The streets are not so busy that you can't. And there are areas where you can actually go and walk. So it's all good. Uh... I think the first thing that comes to mind is the other side of the freeway. Uh, that neighborhood that uh, you don't know it exists at times, but is a big part of Fresno's history. Uh, a place where there are uh, a ton of families and a ton of hardworking people and people really trying to figure out how to make it. Good smells for me is barbecue in the summer, you know, smelling the hot dog, you know, bur or somebody burning the hamburger. You know, just the smell of that makes it home, and that home can be anywhere. I know every Sunday, 
it is either really loud or really quiet because it's football. No matter what, there's football going on. It tastes like barbecue chicken every day, every weekend, I mean, because every weekend was a barbecue somewhere. There was a barbecue somewhere. Half the time you could go down to like the hidden center or right in front of Computech and there'd be a barbecue cookout with the football game on and you just watch football. It is the immortal sense of family and that taste of fellowship and brotherhood that I feel in the West Side. It is all different cultures, all different people, all different foods, smells, sights, rituals, anything that it may be, and accepting all of it for it. And it's truly an amazing thing. So, let me get my video back. I wanted to share that video with you because oftentimes, again, as I was saying earlier, we do this work and we do it from a framing of blight, which is a, you know, very racially charged term, uh, plight, deficit, scarcity, right? And even when you ask folks who are a part of the so-called impacted community, um, that is not how they tell their own story. And so one of my intentions in doing this work around reparations as, you know, as a component of transportation planning is, um, to change how we speak about and think about the communities that are gonna be affected by our decisions. One of the um, current practices that, um, that I really struggle with as a practitioner in the transportation planning space is something that I call purple lining, okay? So this isn't a term that's gonna be in your textbook at school because it's a term that I made up. But the reason I call it purple lining, actually there's a funny story behind it um, we would, saw, you know, be at work trying to sit around the table, do our own version of a, of a studio, and solve for these big philosophical, sociological challenges in our communities by way of transportation planning. And everyone at the table would have a different perspective about what approach we should take, right? There were some folks who felt like it's not our job to think about a person's entire lived experience, our quality of life, right? We're here to build roadways, that's it. Um, there are other people who felt like, yeah, but you know, we could build roadways that facilitate um, access and connectivity. I was the person at the table always asking, do we need to do this at all? And um, Jokingly, every time we had a staff meeting, I would say, here they go with these purple lines because it was like, no matter what the issue was that we were talking about, they would pull up the map and start drawing where the opportunities to put a bike lane were in the community. And the line was always purple. So that's how purple lining gets its name. But it's a much more serious concept, right? It's, the, it's this idea that, um, of course, you know, duplicating the uh, process and ideologies behind redlining. Purple lining is this process that happens in certain neighborhoods, right? And to certain people. Um, and, and we deem those neighborhoods and those people expendable because either they're racialized or they're low wealth, or we think they are, you know, make our, have a certain cultural identity that makes it so that they don't understand and can't speak for themselves. They don't know what they want, right? I hear that a lot in transportation planning. They don't really know, they don't understand what they want. They, so it's, we don't need to keep asking them, right? Or maybe they just don't have um, enough um, political capital in the community. Whatever the case may be, our processes deem those folks expendable. So this is, it's optional. Us talking to a community, like the community members that we just saw in that clip, that's, that's a performative measure in this transportation sector, right? We go there to be able to say we've done a good thing, but the insights and the, the ideas, the assets, the challenges that, that come from their perspective 
rarely inform the work that we do in a real substantial way. Um, and I believe that this happens because of structural and collective efforts to control the means to mobility and movement altogether. In the past, right, when we were talking about redlining, what we really were talking about, you know, as a society was this idea that model citizenship means you're, you're a homeowner, right? You, you can generate generational wealth by way of home ownership. So if we wanna dehumanize a people or a community, then we keep them from accessing um, generational wealth and home ownership. Today, we understand that, you know, mobility, access to a car, access to the road, access to a train or a bus or a bike. Um, those things are also about um, determining whether or not a person or a community is, has, enjoys the same level of humanness as others, right? So purple lining is that this process of dehumanizing the community by limiting their movement and mobility options, right? Because somebody in the mix understands that in doing so, we're able to constrain one's dignity, their ability to, to do kinship connection and social cohesion, right? And their overall wellness and vi uh, vitality. So I have another clip and there's only one more clip after this for folks who um, don't like watching clips. Um, I have another clip though, because I want folks to understand that again, historicizing these issues is not, is problematic, right? One, because we're still doing these things today, which we've already discussed. But two, because even the things that happened yesterday are still impacting people on an emotional, spiritual um, level, right? Folks, entire trajectory of their lives change as a result of some of the harms that they've experienced in the past. So I have another clip that I wanna share with you. Once I uploaded this video to my Twitter feed, it took off hundreds of retweets, likes, and more than 40,000 views with many people chiming in about the pressure to sell their homes in the West Side and the mayor's message for the community. If you live on the West Side, don't sell your house. After getting tons of questions, I reached out to the Century 21 real estate company and sat down with the managing broker, Collis Clovey. That whole area is hot. It's in real estate, we say it's booming. Clovey says the marketplace demand for a piece of the West Side has skyrocketed because of the new billion dollar stadium and property value going up. He says young adults want to move within the city limits, which is part of what's happening. And then there are people who want to buy cheap property and flip the house. You're talking about 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars. After two or three years, those properties are 100, 150 thousand dollars. He says this phenomenon is nothing new. It happened to East Lake, Kirkwood, the Grand Park area, and currently in the West End, too. If one lives in a particular area, and the, there's so much memories and uh, associated with that experience, just selling the home because it went up in value is not always the best thing. The West Side Future Fund says the priority is to keep the people who want to stay in the West Side in their homes. And the Anti-Displacement Tax Fund covers property tax increases for homeowners, but that's just a small percentage of the homes in the West Side. The big question is, what happens to the renters who may not be able to afford a higher rent? The city tells us they're building affordable rental housing and establishing zoning ordinances that require affordable units with any new rental developments. For more info, visit 11alive.com. Naima Abdullahi, 11 Alive News. So the video that we just watched was a video about Atlanta's Greenbelt. That, um, I forget how exactly how many miles it is, but it's essentially a bike path that spans um, all of the, you know, downtown Atlanta and adjacent areas. Um, it's all, you know, that, that bike lane or that bike path um, was inspired by other development happening in the area. You saw the development of the stadium underway, which you know, this is a story that folks who live in LA are about to become very familiar with. Um, even when we look at the way media discusses um, gentrification, what is not lost on me is that there's no mention 
of the role that transportation planning played in that, right? What really happened was a the bike path has been speculated about for a long time. It finally got funded. It went into construction. Housing speculation began to happen. Um, advocates saw that and organized and convinced the local government to um, put um, certain types of agreements into developer contracts to make it so that um, there was a certain number of affordable housing left at the end of and during the project's construction. Um, that mandate existed in those contracts. And what the developers did was they built the affordable housing units, right? And when they were done constructing the bike lane or the bike path, they tore them down. They felt like it was more cost effective for them as developers to build so-called affordable housing that would be temporary, that essentially no one would ever get an opportunity to live in, um, and wait for the mandated time period to pass to finish the entire development, demolish them so that then they could participate in the cycle and process of gentrification. When they advertised for the market rate housing after demolishing the affordable housing, one of the biggest, uh, one of the most talked about components uh, or, or what do you call it, amenities of the community was the bike lane or the bike path. We have a role to play in this. And for whatever reason, media doesn't talk about it, right? So my job in this work is to make sure that changes. We're not gonna continue to ignore the fact that we have a, a very direct role and impact in these communities, right? So when folks ask me, Destiny, of all things, why reparations, right? Because sometimes I talk about harm reduction. Um, I talk about planning from a public health perspective too. But the, this question of why reparations is really simple for me, right? This is the only appropriate response to what we've seen in the past and to what we're seeing today. If we're talking about upending and replacing, essentially abolishing um, harmful systems and structures, right, that have happened over time, the only way to do that is to replace those harmful system structures and people uh, with system structures and people that are ex ex have the expressed intention of healing and preventing that harm from ha continuing to happen. So um, reparations makes some folks cringe because um, it is seen as a request for accountability. And it is a type of accountability, right? And the problem that we have in our society is uh, the way we have come to know account no accountability is rooted in shame. It's rooted in um, punitive recourse, it's rooted in violence, right? How we respond to people who make harmful choices in our society is very violent. And so it makes sense that folks would be fearful or resistant of any kind of accountability for an atrocity as, as big as slavery and racism, right? Because if black folks or black legislators were to um, apply a version of accountability that matches the culture of accountability in this country, um, I could see why certain people would be afraid of those outcomes. But reparations is not that, right? Reparations is a type of accountability that centers the impacted person or the impacted um, community and allows their voices, their oral histories um, to shape the um, opportunities for atonement, right? All we need our systems and governments to do is participate um, in the form of reparations, right? We don't, we don't we're not looking to see um, punishment, so to speak. Another question that often comes up is reparations for whom, right? Because unfortunately, this country has a, a legacy of harming just about everybody, except, you know, cisgender white men, Christians too. And so why then, Dr. Thomas, are we focusing on reparations for Black folks? And this is really simple for me also. 
Um, it's, I have a really clear understanding of where all forms of oppression come, come from. I often refer to this as oppression's origin story, right? So when we think about how the various forms of oppression work, uh, sexism, classism, ableism, uh, xenophobia, right? All of those function in ways that mimic the earliest forms of oppression, which are othering, right? And this notion of othering is basically saying, how can people with power maintain and keep that power, right? By keeping others from having access to it. Therefore, they need to differentiate themselves from the other folks that they don't want to also have power. The easiest way to differentiate themselves was to create cultural markers, right? So when I look at a person, if they don't look like me, then they don't have access to my power. And so the earliest forms of this naturally are anti-Blackness, right? Because the darker your skin is, the less proximity to power you should have, and gender shortly thereafter. So this is, this is my understanding of oppression's origin story. And I firmly believe if we are able to get to the bottom of how anti-Blackness works over time and today, um, and develop systems and processes and structures and leadership that can challenge and disrupt anti-Blackness, then we can use those same systems and processes and leaders to disrupt all other forms of oppression. So it's very, very important to me that through root cause analysis, we develop a framework for reparations that centers Black folks and the effects of anti-Blackness in the United States so that we can also address how ableism is showing up in our work how transphobia is showing up in our work and so on and so forth. Um, last year during Black History Month, we saw the video of um, the young folks trying to ride their bikes um, in Brooklyn, I think, uh, about 30, 40 years ago. And I remember watching that and, and wondering uh, where these folks are as adults and like how that experience has changed their relationship to the built environment. So um, I found this, this clip from the New York Times where they were able to catch up with those adults um, and get their take on what they experienced that day. We had called them bike hikes. We were just going out to go explore your world. It would be at least six, seven, eight of us. Our parents said, as long as you were home before the street lights came on, you stayed as a group, you're fine. It was a beautiful day, sunshine. The children in the neighborhood planned to go on a trip to McDonald's, just have some fun, something different to do. Rosedale, we thought, was a safe place. We all went down, we were riding our bikes. And then we saw down the block that there was this beautiful American flag blowing in the wind. We saw a group outside on the block, so we was like, oh, this is a block party. The last thing that I remember was someone saying, oh, a parade. And so we went down to go see the parade, and I laugh about it to this day because it was a parade to get the black people out of Rosedale. <laughs> It's the summer of 1975. White residents in Rosedale, Queens, are protesting black families moving into the neighborhood. These are scenes from a documentary produced by journalist Bill Moyers. Does he have a right to live here? No. 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 Why not? Because he's black. This was not the South. This was not Greenville, Mississippi, or Spartanburg, South Carolina, or Atlanta, Georgia. This was right in the heart of the greatest metropolitan area in the country. The documentary was found nearly 45 years later by a graduate student who posted a short clip on the internet. It went viral on Twitter and Facebook. 
And a question people kept asking, where are the kids now? Hey, Rob, this is Whitney Hurst calling from The New York Times. My name is Whitney Hurst. I'm a journalist. To answer that question, we called more than 90 people who had lived in Rosedale at that I'm time. trying to find anyone that might have known someone. We couldn't find any white residents who said they'd been there. It came out because it got a little bit crazy. But we spoke with several of the black children. We wanted to hear what happened to them that day to understand why their experience is resonating decades later. We went down to see what was going on, probably in the middle of the blocks. That's when we figured out it was something else. And it was something that we definitely were not invited to. We noticed that they were running towards us. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, like, why are they rushing towards us, not thinking anything negative? And then we heard, nigger. And they surrounded my best friend at the time, Marina. One of the young men hit her. And they started calling us names. They started throwing rocks. Hearing the word, hearing it directed at me, why are you calling me that? That's not me. You know, I've always been told, that's not me. I didn't understand. I was like, who do you think you are to say we can't come here? Like, how dare you? What happened to you? This little button, he threw the rock. He, he tried to hit me, my sister, but he almost hit me about that much away from me. And I was sure I wish he had hit me with that rock. I would pick up the rock right next to me and hit him right in his face. I was just kind of amazed to see that people can act like that, to tell you the truth. But that was like really the first where I was like, wow, people do not like black people. They gonna always do that. They always spit on us like we some dogs. They always spit gonna back do that. on them. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing gonna change. I immediately was reminded of those programs my parents would have me watch with the dogs and the and the hoses and people trying to vote and being killed and lynch. It just it went right back to my history in this country. It just linked me immediately with that whole experience because I felt it. Do you forgive them? No. No. Oh, no. Can't take back no hurt. And I didn't know what to do with those feelings. I did not know what to do with those feelings. For Moyers, the video going viral shows how powerful images can be. He tried to hit my sister, but he was we were in their neighborhood. I mean, I do believe that television has been a great teacher. This country didn't really respond to what was going on in the South, although it was well known, until the sheriff in Birmingham turned the water hoses and the dogs on those young people who were demonstrating there. We knew about it, we heard about it, we were aware of it, but we didn't see it. We couldn't escape it once we saw it. South Jamaica was coming through the neighborhood in a demonstration of support. Every time a group of blacks get together and want to help Rosedale with their problems, we don't need any outsiders helping us with our problems. And we'll stay white, period. All right, so guys, this next scene is very disturbing. All right, it's the one I was telling you about yesterday. I started a sociology elective in 2004, 2005 school year, and my supervisor at the time, he said, come up with something that's close to home that maybe you can relate to today. I grew up in Rosedale. And I said, I want to do a unit on race in America. And that Rosedale video, they've been showing it for 15 years now. You know, giving it to the kids and say, what do you think? I've never seen racism on camera. That was full on racism and just bullying. I'm glad that I saw it because it needs to be seen. I feel like everyone should see this. I think it's come back up because of the fact that we're going back, kind of. Racism is still alive. It's still poisoning other minds. This is how it was back then. Let's not repeat it again. So I'm almost wrapped up because I know we need to do question and answer. But like 
the question that's coming up for me is how can we do this work in a way that doesn't require my peers um, and the young folks who are, you know, in, in class being trained to be practitioners of the built environment? How do we do this without for our communities having to relive that trauma, right? How many videos do we need to show? How many times do I have to tell the story about my encounter with police brutality, right? And, and so this work of reparations is also about acknowledging the truth, right, of this legacy um, and not continuing down this um, endless path of evidentiary discovery, right? We know racism is a problem. So for folks who are still in that headspace of like needing to know the extent to which racism is a problem or being able to measure and see on maps where racism existed, um, it's important to like unpack and, and reflect on why you need that to, to, to witness and be a spectator to that level of, of trauma um, and, and why that is getting in the way of us implementing solutions. So there are different kinds of reparations. And I just wanna say that um, what the work we are doing, right? Reparations through transportation planning in no way replaces the work that needs to be done um, in a broader sense of reparations. Cause I think sometimes folks see this as like, oh, this is a reparations I can get behind. And like, this is just uh, one element of it. Um, so I wanna make sure folks understand the different kinds of reparations um, and how they're defined. So there's restitution um, where you're, you know, restoring a victim to their position before the violation occurred, right? This is restitution is what our current, current, current criminal justice system is modeled after. There's compensation where there's a financial award for harm that's happened. And this is what our civil court system is modeled behind. There's rehabilitation where um, the person who's experienced harm um, has access to the resources that it needs in order to, to heal. There's satisfaction, which um, this is what I, where I feel like our field is kind of getting stuck um, and not making progress. The satisfaction is like the symbolic reparation. So these are the public statements that we saw coming out last year, public apologies, um, studies like the one we're doing, right? And, and trying to identify who all the victims were so that they can share their stories, right? Um, and then there are guarantees. So guarantees are the type of reparations I'm really interested in when it comes to land use planning. It's not the only type, but this is where I feel like we have a real opportunity um, to, to you know, put some action to some of the, the you know, decorative words and that we saw shared um, in our field last year. Guarantees are, um, is the work that we do to avoid repeating, right, the harm that's happened. And the guarantees are not just a saying, okay, here's a policy that says we'll never do this again. The guarantees have to include the person who's been harmed believing that this won't happen again. When you're dealing with something like trauma, right? You saw that, that uh, woman who's probably now in her 60s still crying like, like that attack on her happened yesterday. Um, there's so much work that has to go into resolving that trauma for a person for them to believe that this can't and won't happen again. And so I think this is where we kind of get um, lazy or maybe some of us burnt out. Um, and, and I've heard folks say, okay, can I hear you, but like, can you acknowledge that we've made progress or that we've done a lot? And that's not the point, right? The point is, do I feel like we've done enough? And the answer is no. So the Thrivens Group and in the research project that I'm about to go over, we use a reparations litmus test. These are the four elements that have to be included in any solution or uh, uh, intervention or policy um, so that we are at least satisfying this notion of repair, right? And these four elements apply to all of the different kinds of reparations. 
The first thing is that the policy on its own or in combination with another, another policy has to be able to address a specific element of harm, right? So having one policy, naming it reparations, and then inviting whoever can fit into the definition of, of harm to participate in the atonement is not an appropriate form of reparations, right? So this is another reason why when people ask me, why are we focusing on black folks? Well, because the racialized experience of a black person is different from the racialized experience of a brown person who has also experienced trauma. And we all deserve an opportunity to be a part of a reparations and atonement process that um, specifically addresses what we've been through, right? And, and so in order to do that, you do need to do research and you do need to collect the perspectives of the impacted community and to just make sure you are even framing the harm in a way that matches the experience that the person or the community has had. The second part of this is that the policy or the, the intervention plan has to identify a specific intentional recipient of the issue, specific direct intervention. And what we mean by that is, if we are atoning for the legacy of slavery, part of the justification of that has to be us naming who was enslaved, right? So again, I, and I've seen this in recent discussions when we see you know, our politicians talking about whether or not they have a black platform. And they say, well, we are, we've passed healthcare and we're giving money to schools and the Build Back Better plan, right? And, and like, that's gonna benefit black folks. But is that its intention, right? So this work is about um, not finding some tertiary intervention that benefits everyone and happens to benefit, benefit black folks. And also there's no requisite that everyone has to benefit from something that benefits black folks. The third thing here is that the eligibility or qualifying factor can't pose an additional burden or barrier that would contribute to a new or additional displacement in, in the context we usually use. But harm is another word that we could replace displacement with. And what we mean by that is, um, for example, the reparations bill that was passed in um, Evanston, Illinois, where they were gonna create um, subsidized housing for descendants of um, their version of slavery and racism in that area. Um, great program on paper, but from what we are hearing, the hurdles and application processes, proof of, of, of being harmed, um, all of those processes are much more burdensome and traumatic than just going out and paying for your own housing to begin with. The other piece of that is um, what we're not looking to do is give Black folks access to systems that are already harming other folks, right? So we're not just saying, all right, give Black folks access to wealth so that they can participate in capitalism too. Right? It's about looking at the system and asking ourselves, one, um, does the system in and of itself fit in a post-reparation society? Um, and, and the answer is always no. And so then the question becomes, what are we creating right, in response to the harm that we know Black people have experienced? The last thing is that um, the policy or the intervention has to have the intention of creating a permanent redress for the impacts of past harmful planning. So a temporary um, universal income or temporary free bus pass, right? Does not fit into the framework or the litmus test of reparations. So very quickly for about five minutes, I'm gonna go into the, that we're currently working on in partnership with Transform, which is based out of California and University of Texas in Austin. Um, and, and then we'll wrap up and, and we can um, dialogue a little bit. So we were um, really excited to be selected to lead a research effort through the Transportation Research Board um, competitive process called Racial Equity, Black America and Public Transportation. And again, um, this is um, a team comprised of Thrivance Group, 
UT Austin and Transform. And basically there are three main objectives associated with the project. The first thing is that um, we wanna be able to help decision makers in the transportation planning sector and the transportation sector broadly understand exactly how black communities have been harmed as a result of our prior transportation and land use decisions. The second thing is we want to develop and demonstrate methods that agencies can use to understand the magnitude of and re redress these prior harms. And that's my favorite um, objective of the whole thing, right? Being able to um, quantify, because I know that that is often coming up in our arguments about reparations, quantify the harm and, and propose mechanisms for that fit that, the scale of harm that's happened. And the last thing is creating the materials and tools that will help these decision makers make choices differently moving forward. So while, while this project doesn't address all of the different types of reparations, as I've mentioned before, it does meet the litmus test for reparative planning. The approach that we're taking to do this work includes uh, interviews, focus groups, and surveys that center the impacted communities and people, as well as those who advocate alongside them. So um, we're doing a combination of folks that um, work in and are really versed in transportation, the transportation sector um, and their understanding of inequity within it. And we're also working with folks who um, have nothing to do with transportation, but are heavily rooted in the work that's been happening for decades around um, various forms of reparations for slavery in the United States. The other thing we're doing, the second thing we're doing is, cre is using a culturally contextual approach to geographic equity. So we know that any solutions that come out of this or recommendations that come out of this um, are not gonna be able to be applied as a blanket approach, right? So we are taking the time to understand um, how these impacts are manifest in different regions of the country, as well as in certain, in different geographic typologies, right? So. An uh, agricultural industrial context like Fresno is going to be much different from a suburban context that you might see in Oklahoma, right? Or the um, challenges one might face in Harlem or Brooklyn. And so making sure that that comes through in our recommendations is important. And also lifting up the um, current impacts of colonization for Black folks um, in places like Puerto Rico and um, and uh, you know Puerto Rico and in the in the Virgin Islands, right? So those are Black folks who are of essentially part of the United States, um, but their port of entry by way of slavery just happened to be different, and they're continuing to experience the impacts of slavery. I think at a magnitude that is much different um, than what we experience here on mainland United States. And then the last thing is that we're making sure that we always have a circle of accountability. That's important. Um, a lot of um, planning firms and agencies are doing this equity work, diversity and inclusion work. Um, and so it's important to stop and make sure that you are working with so-called experts that have a circle of accountability around them and that they are um, literally asking for permission from the communities that, that they're a part of but represent um, and that they have that checks and balance in place outside of the you know, the structure, the system system that's paying them to do the work. So I will stop there. Thank you again for having me um, and for, you know, leaning into this very important uh, discourse about reparations and transportation planning. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Thomas. So I think the way that we're gonna do the Q&A is um, if folks have questions for Dr. Thomas, you can um, either put them into the chat or raise your hand and um, we can unmute you. And then I think Tony has been keeping on the YouTube stream. Uh, I, Tony, you can pass me any questions um, there. So we'll give folks kind of a minute to collect your thoughts. And then if there's anything for Dr. Thomas, um, I can kind of open up with a question that um, I've been thinking about a lot. So um, we, you, you talked about the kind of the necessity of repairing and atoning for prior harm 
before moving forward. And it just seems like, I feel like that's super important, but the, the, the profession, our colleagues don't really have that, don't have that same perspective. We can see it across the board. Um, in Austin, we have a major public transit expansion plan that's underway called Project Connect. It's a $7 billion plan um, rolling out over 30 years with new rail lines, new bus rapid transit, nothing as it turns out for existing bus riders. Um, no, no, no attention seemingly paid to the folks who rely on public transit today and how they'll uh, get around under this new plan. So we have that, we have the expansion of Interstate 35 in Austin. We have the expansion of Interstate 45 in Houston expected to displace um, disproportionate uh, people of color and low income people at disproportionate rates, exactly the same as what was going on before, you know, to other points that you've made. So in the face of this, you know, these continuing harms, um, like what can we do um, as educators, as practitioners to um, like it, intervene in these projects that are happening like right now? Um, Cause I, educating the profession, uh, creating change will take time, but like we need to do, we have to take action today. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually a question that comes up every time we do our nine week Dignity Institute, right? Great, I love learning these things, but like I know the folks I work with are not gonna like stop what they're doing and now start this dignity infused process. And my response and my reminder to folks is what I am actually, the call to action that I'm showing up with is one that does not like you don't get credit for it. You know what I'm saying? You don't get to call it the reparations point of the project. This is your way of being. So if the project is on your desk, you have that litmus test, you're that, you're, you embody that litmus test, right? So how you plan a project is through this framework. How you contribute to the conversation is through this framework. And maybe strategically, it's not, all right, y'all, well, I want to make sure we're sprinkling the reparations in this, right? Maybe that is just how you do work. I think that's something that's really important. The other thing, though, that I think is equally as important is that while we don't have control over or maybe um, access to power within processes and projects that are already underway, what we do have the opportunity to do is create processes and projects that expressly name reparation as the only intention, right? And this goes into the third thing that I'm about to say, what we need to stop doing is associating reparations with tangential efforts, right? So, um, well, this is really great, you all, because we get the... Uh, pedal assist bikes share bike share system and the black folks have access to it and then like so it's reparations plus bike advocacy you know what I'm saying like we don't we need to stop doing that because what's going to happen is we're going to get to a point in this country hopefully where we get uh, an executive branch that's serious about reparations and what I'm scared that I'm going to see happen is all these local jurisdictions who did these tangential efforts get up and say, oh no, we already did our reparations. We don't need to do it, right? So we need to be really clear about um, not forcing folks who are not willing, not forcing entities who are not willing to name their work reparations if it truly isn't, right? And, and creating projects and policies and processes that are reparative. We've got to do both. Um, Jessica, do you want to go ahead? I think I can unmute you here. There you go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, just really powerful talk. Uh, I was really curious about your work and how you've seen equity tools come up in the conversation um, and your take on them of whether they can make a difference or whether they're just kind of this side tool that you know we put numbers to to try to justify where projects should go or where we can what neighborhoods to focus on. Thank you again. 
Yeah, great question. That's something that I call procedural community engagement. Um, procedural engagement has its pros and its cons. Procedural engagement is good because um, it establishes a at least a um, venue for having a conversation about equity. Um, but what you're hinting at, right, is that um, the spirit in which those tools have been created rarely shows up in the project outcomes. And I think this is because we are having a crisis of representation in our workforce. Um, if I pick the tool up and use it, my application of it is gonna be much different from someone who's just looking to check the boxes, right? And so uh, I think I was in this, having an argument with someone yesterday and I said to them, uh, we've got to be willing to let go of this generation of workforce that is just checking boxes. We listen, I'll, if you want to pay me to create a guidebook, I'll make 10. You know what I'm saying? But at some point we got to stop creating tools and workarounds, you know, for our problematic colleagues and the decision makers are going to have to start saying you can't work here. Right. And by representation, I'm not just talking about having more Black folks at the table. I personally have experienced where if there's not ideological diversity, right? If, if, if my racialized experience doesn't match or isn't represented in the leadership, be them Black or not, of my local uh, DOT, then their projects are not going to be relevant to me. So we've got to do more than just hire the woman, hire the black person. And we got to stop celebrating that. You know what I'm saying? We have to stop doing, yes, all women. No, these women are harmful. These black folks are toxic sometimes, you know? So we've, we've got to, if we are going to create a tool, I would like to see a tool that allow, helps people make decisions in ways that aren't tokenizing. Tokenism is a huge problem in this industry. So I don't know if I answered your question. Are the tools good? Yes. I need tools. I, I, I love picking those tools up because they help me and I learn from them. But that's because of the, the spirit, spirit that I embody, right? The, it's a tool. If I give a hammer to someone who's not a carpenter, they're going to tear my house up, right? So hire a carpenter to do the work. Other questions, comments, discussion points? Um, uh, Dean Addington. Let's see. Hi, um, and thank you so much for this. This was, uh, was an incredible talk, and I was just so thrilled to see how good the audience was, uh, given the fact that uh, we're we're out for an ice day uh, today. So it was it was fantastic to the audience. We're just sorry you weren't here, but hope to have you uh, soon. Um, uh, I guess this is a, a more of an open ended question, and I'm I'm not sure where it'll go. But um, you know, there's a lot of shibboleths in the way that we. The, the, that where I'd say tentacles, a lot of our planning strategies sort of go deep and far uh, into what are in many cases, these, these beliefs that um, you know, guide the way that a lot of decisions are being made. And I, you know, for example, uh, the increasing push uh, densification in cities comes from a transportation study done in the eighties which has you know, long since be, been debunked in terms of whether it actually sort of like relates to uh, per capita uh, energy, energy reduction, yet it'll still guide most cities planning. And a lot of sort of the push for, for density is, is uh, you know, how we're seeing our own neighborhoods like East Austin uh, be decimated. Um, with, uh, you know, the, the current community, uh, their homes being replaced uh, by five over ones uh, almost on a, on a daily basis on that. 
There, there are other ones as well, the, the deep belief in a trickle-down economy by bringing in a big, wealthy uh, company, uh, and yet it's not there to provide sort of the jobs or the opportunities uh, for those who, who sit in different types of socioeconomic groups. And there's many more like that that sometimes seem really far away from the question at hand, and yet it's part of a set of beliefs that everybody seemed not to question and sort of use as overarching principles. And so I'm not sure what my question is as to, this is a really, really difficult sort of set of charges that we have and a really difficult set of problems that sort of like following these tentacles out to what's actually also sort of like constraining what the real opportunities are for moving forward. I think you make an excellent point. And I saw Jonathan mention Tesla in the comments and I laughed because I just did an interview with CNBC about Tesla. And I said something similar to what you just raised, right? And I mean, this is happening everywhere. We see in, in the Bay Area, they have an opportunity to build a mega region level of connectivity through all of the various transit operators, including BART. Um, and those conversations began with a conversation about, you know, the Twitter campus and the Facebook campus, right? All of whom are no longer campuses because of the pandemic. So, so we've invest, invested billions of dollars in a transportation network to get um, the tech bros to and from deep East Oakland, which was never where they wanted to live, right? And San Francisco um, or wherever the, these campuses are. And, and now they, with the flip of a switch, can just decide, actually, this isn't the travel pattern we want. What, what becomes of those networks, right? And so this is this behavior, which we are also seeing in Inglewood with the introduction of a new stadium, right? This behavior is what I call planning for white comfort. It's not efficient. It's not cost-effective. It's hella whimsical right? It's fleeting, very much Gemini energy, and I'm a Gemini, so I can say that, right? It's here today, gone tomorrow type of behavior, but we're building infrastructure that kills us for generations, and so this planning for white comfort, you know, is a real issue, and I think it's about literally sitting at the table, maybe finding another more strategic way to frame it, but sitting at the table and asking ourselves, hey, y'all, like, do we need this? You know what I'm saying? Or is this, we're doing this to make certain people, people's travel experience more comfortable. And one of the ways that I have reframed this work, because I am a transit advocate, a lot of folks don't know that about me. I'm critical of transit, but I'm an advocate too, is maybe it's not transit oriented development, right? What is the housing first model of this? You know what I'm saying? What if it's housing, housing oriented transit? That's a different perspective, right? Maybe it's not transit oriented development. Maybe it's harm reductive transit, right? Can we talk about sex trafficking and how complicit our transit networks have become? How do we design um, network operations knowing that at certain hours of the day, our babies are being kidnapped and vanishing in, into thin air in broad daylight because our transit operators are scared to ask, what you doing with this little girl? You know what I'm saying? Like transit orient development seems very inanimate, like planning for inanimate objects and forgetting that these are humans, right? That, that we're creating these systems and these networks for. So you raise um, an excellent, excellent, excellent point. I'd like to see um, transit stations being used um, to deliver social services to our communities. I would love if I can get, you know, have a one-stop shop at my transit station, right? And instead of going to a Walmart, you know, um, and having like local artisans be able to sell their things there without being criminalized is really important to me. I would love to get my instance and my tampons from the same place, you know? So I think we need to think about what is so problematic. Like this is so problematic that transit oriented development even is a framing in our field. You wanna build around your preferred tr 
travel route, that seems backwards to me, you know? So great point. Thank you for raising that point. And I wish I was there too, but I, I told Alex, I'll come in the summer. I won't be dieting then, you know, it'll be good. I could eat good. It'll be good. A lot of, yeah, we'll, we'll take you on a, a little tour, a little food tour when you, when you come. Um, John Claudia, do you want to jump in? Oh, I think I have to get you. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for this talk. I uh, really appreciated all of the visual material you brought in. It was really phenomenal. Um, I have a question for you, a very kind of big picture structural question. Um, if we look at structures for federal and state transportation spending and policy, a lot of that is oriented around the systems we already have. So if you take the billions that are in the IIJA or the you know, bipartisan infrastructure law, um, $250 billion uh, in that bill at, at the very least is, is probably going to be spent on um, repairing, maintaining, existing systems or potentially expanding them at the margins. So with the, the huge amount of infrastructure we already have that's been built in previous paradigms around disregard for black people and other communities of color, how do we um, how do we do something different? You know, there's uh, there's a significant path dependency in just maintaining what there is out there. Um, and I, I I ask that question not to excuse what's out there, but to yeah, to really sort of puzzle through what's involved. <laughs> um, I mean, there, you know, we could, we could look at instances where uh, we could say, yes, we're going to, you know, there's a particular freeway segment in an urban community that is redundant and it could be torn down and, you know, it, it opens up tons of opportunities in the community. Um, but there is a lot of significant, very costly infrastructure that has harmed communities, continues to harm them, um, and yet our economy is, you know, built around this. Yeah, you know, if I ever, if I have the answer to that question, please vote for me for president. But I do think that I have learned so much from the atrocities of redlining and that like the same conversation that could be had about home ownership can be at, had about like, what does it look like for um, neighborhood networks to have co-ownership of their transportation and mobility? And I'm, I mean, literal ownership, not, you know, philosophical ownership. I mean, like, um, so if there is a freeway adjacent to my neighborhood, um, like whoever that truck driver is already paying taxes and fees to, to be able to use that freight route, um, that needs to be routed to me, right? Um, if there is a train station that is um, expressly servicing tech bros, then their revenue from that transit fare needs to come to me, right? And I think a lot of times when we talk about stopping harm and reparations for black folks, the assumption is that what we mean by that is you can't build anymore, stop doing what you're doing, right? Which is kind of like the, the desired outcome, but also um, we get that that's not um, probably gonna happen. So within what is already happening, how can we apply the litmus test so that we are at least moving toward repair? Um, and I think there, you know, the Shell Mound community in Emeryville 
there's a beautiful story there where, um, not beautiful, but there's a story that to learn a lot from where the city of Emeryville wanted to build the shopping center, center that is currently there, Shell Mound um, in Emeryville. You know, Victoria's Secrets, movie theaters, CPK, that type of thing. And they went through this whole process behind closed doors and the indigenous community whose land that belonged to um, found out really late in the process, like about to break down, about to break down ground that point in the process. And everyone was shook, like, we don't want the indigenous folks to know we're doing this because they're going to get in the way, you know? And I'm sure if they had been engaged early in the process, they would have stopped that project from happening. But at that point, the solution became great. So every receipt generated on this shopping, you know, center, um, there's a tax that needs to go right back to our, you know, indigenous community for us to spend how we choose. And to this day, that um, reparations tax it still exists. It's on receipts. Just folks don't notice it. Right. So it's about um, this reparations is a it's a type of transformative justice, even. Right. It's about asking the person that's been harmed what makes them whole and not being too afraid of what their answer is. <laughs> right. I also live in my community. I live here. I want to ride my bike, too. So maybe if you just ask me, there's a solution that is not as you know, drastic or transformative as you think it would be. Um, but when we do get the drastic and transformative solutions, we need to be willing to do that too. So I don't know, I don't really have an answer to that question, but I do think that, um, that like folks need to stop operating out of fear, right? You're, you're either doing this work in the interest of black folks or you're not. And I think it's that simple. So folks saying like, well, I'm just doing my job and I didn't have a choice. I really don't have empathy for that, if I'm being real. I want to be mindful of the time. So we're, we're technically at time. Um, Dr. Thomas, can you stay on for a few more minutes? Seems like there's a couple yeah. more questions. Okay, I would have been there eating anyway. There. <laughs> great. Um, Jean-Claude, do you, do you have like a follow-up? Yeah, okay. So I'll get Jean-Claude and then we'll go to Allison. Yeah, just a quick follow up. Uh, just I'm sort of seeing a parallel between what you're proposing and Donald Shoup's approach to parking. And his ideas about parking are we make people pay for it. And when we have place specific parking charges, those revenues should go back to the community. And so if I think about I, I 35 here in Austin, um, I would much rather see pricing be used than a full-blown expansion. And if we could institute pricing, um, there'd be legal, lots of legal complexity in figuring out how to do this within the U.S. funding framework, but bringing the, the fees for using that corridor to the communities it passes through. Yeah, because if we tear down, let's say we tear down the freeways, right? This, this is the problem with toxic liberalism. We tear down all the freeways that have been harmful and torn up black communities. What are we doing with the land? Which is toxic soil at this point because it's been a freeway for 60 years. What are, who, who owns that? And ownership of land is already a very problematic question. They're gonna try to put a school on it and say, here, like access to education for black folks, which is not what, like we have not been asking for that. <laughs> we have not been asking for more labor to do more work. We have been asking to be made whole for what has happened to us. And so like that is very complex. It's just as complex as creating a, a fee structure or a pricing structure for use of that type of infrastructure. So either way, we're in like a really complex conversation, um, either about what to do with land that used to be problematic freeway or uh, how to tax folks using the problematic freeway. I, I just am of the belief that the answer to that is different in every context. And I am, I'm really interested in seeing the impacted community lead that discussion and not be one point in a longer process. Okay, Allison, I'm gonna 
Can you unmute? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, again, I wanted to say thank you for joining us in in this space. Like I, I always try to uh, talk to like my non-white peers. Like we'll get together and we'll have to do like the environmental racism project, and they get so nervous about it. And I'm like, literally, you can't get this wrong. It's your life experience. And so I just want to like you know highlight to everyone like it's such an honor to learn about you know, like the topic of racism from a non-white person, like, so that, right, I appreciate you, you're necessary, your work is, is very necessary, so very much thank you for joining us, and also thank you for your shout out to the ancestors, because I try also as well to, like, keep in contact with them, but um, I also hope you get a chance to practice self-care if you just experience some travel turmoil as well, um, but I, I got really emotional in your presentation, because I'm just, you know, so excited about, like, everything you're saying and also really sad at the same time and like I really appreciated your note on like uh people who don't like videos because it's me I'm people who don't like videos but like at the same time like I appreciated uh your framing I think that's what, what Gabby Gabby put it really nice and what she said I appreciated your framing of it because I feel like it, it is you know really necessary to show these representations because there are like scholars who are uncomfortable with the idea of the the continuous and ongoing like legacy of white supremacy and anti-blackness and I specifically for me it, it resonated with me because I thought of this personal experience I had at uh, the African burial ground in New York like there was this interactive um, I guess kind of interactive exhibition that basically asked you to like push a barrel to see if it could bear the weight of an enslaved person and I remember just like feeling how just like so upset in that moment because it's just like why can't we just believe you you know what I mean like why can't we just believe in black pain, like, no, I cannot carry the weight of an enslaved black person like that is. And so I, it made me question just like, and that's why, oh, sorry, getting emotional. But I appreciated your note on, on ableism because it's like, I feel like that is where, you know, ableism and anti-blackness really come together because it's like, you you know, there's there's this history of just denying um, of black pain. And, and again, sorry, I'm like, I'm really going in, but I also appreciated your critique on just like general welfare legislation not being enough because I think not enough scholars are aware of the fact that white women benefit the most from welfare. And so it's like anytime this is happening, we're just helping white women and then accidentally helping black people and then still taking credit for that and building publicity around that. And again, scholars don't admit that either. And so all of this to say is just, I just feel like a lot of planners are not ready to just like question how like white supremacy has traumatized them because they don't ever sit down and question like how do I fail to meet the ideal standard of, of whiteness? What is it about my identity that makes me divergent in what ways and how does that then connect me to this overall, you know, dedication to ending anti-blackness because it's all connected. And so again, thank you so much. Please take some time to take care of yourself today and please I'm so excited to keep up with your work so drop like your social media I will follow you and all of the things thank you for being here thank you I appreciate your energy so I definitely will make sure we connect offline thank you for all of the affirmation um on ableism this is something really important to me uh, we talk often about race as a social construct I'm we don't have time to go into that for folks who haven't been introduced to that concept, but race is a social construct. Also, we are having a racialized experience, right? So the fact that race was quote unquote made up, right? To preserve power structures does not make my experience as a person who's been racialized by that process a moot point. On ableism, if you were to really sit back and ask yourself, what makes a person disabled, right? The only answer to that is something that has to do with how this person's body is spoken about, treated, perceived by our society and systems of normative bodies, right? Disabled is a social construct and also an experience that many of us are having. So if naming someone disabled is a mechanism of, of othering, you are not a normative body, your body is not functioning in a way that I have called normal, 
right? How is that different from anti-Blackness? It's not. In fact, when we look at the statistics about um, discrimination against disabled people, it is the Black folks and the, pers- the people with the most melanin who experience the, the extremes of that ableism. Elijah McCoy was on the autism spectrum and was killed while performing what his parents taught him to say when a person is questioning his non-normative body. I am going for a walk, I'm different, I'm different. I have a card that explains my difference, shot dead. So yeah, I'm really serious when I say all forms of oppression stem from from anti-Blackness because it is a mechanism of marking someone as other. The easiest way to do that, I mean, you may not be able to tell a person is disabled when you look at them, right? One of the earliest mechanisms was your skin is dark. Gender was not even really a construct back then, right? Everyone was wearing dresses and heels. So we've, we've got to be like, this is a whole nother talk, but like transportation planning and infrastructure is very masculinized. And by masculinized, I'm not just talking about masculine energy. I'm talking about what um, Allison was just speaking about, right? The impossibleness of attaining even like within a white male body the impossibility of attaining normativity for all of us. And like the folks' unwillingness to see that as their, as also their plight is why we're in the situation that we're in. It's why Whoopi Goldberg is catching heat. You know what I'm saying? Why she don't understand what racism is. It's, it's, it's why, you know, the Trumpers were climbing over the wall looking wild on the 6th last year of January. You know, it's, Folks don't understand what it means to have a unified struggle that's bound up in other struggles. It's all connected. What you call it is irrelevant. In fact, if we stop using that naming system, we might make some progress. So thank you, Allison. Definitely reach out. All right. Uh, Well, thanks so much, everyone. Let's uh, give Dr. Thomas another uh round of applause here on, on Zoom. Um, and thanks so much for staying a, a little bit extra. Um, I'm, I'm really deeply appreciate your time. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. So we, I think this will live on YouTube. So if folks want to revisit um, anything that we discussed and please kind of stay tuned for future city forums and for future interactions with Dr. Thomas. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Um, Destiny, can you stay on for a sec? How does she leave?